Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. Of the six topics identified in the opening address of Senior Counsel assisting last week, we now move to the fifth topic. That topic is car loans. A car loan, unsurprisingly, generally refers to a personal loan with the specific purpose of buying a new or used motor vehicle. There are, however, other methods of obtaining finance for a motor vehicle, to which you may hear some reference, including obtaining a line of credit or entering into a lease or similar arrangement. We will not deal with those specific issues. As was identified at the very first hearing of the Commission, the car is a crucial element underpinning the day-to-day -day lives of most Australians. We will hear evidence in a moment of Ms Nalini Thiruvangadam that she, like many Australians, needed to buy a car to ferry her children to school and to undertake work as a home carer. She, of course, is not alone. As the traffic on our roads shows, Australians rely on cars to travel to and from work, to take care of their loved ones and, of course, to undertake the daily tasks of life. In those circumstances, the purchase of a car for many the largest expenditure of their lives, or second only after a home, needs to be a transaction that is conducted honestly and fairly. Our inquiries so far, and what you will hear in this part of the hearing, has revealed that those standards have not always been met. In its regulatory impact statement in March 2017, ASIC indicated that 90% of all car sales are arranged through finance. Of these sales, around 39%, or approximately 480,000 sales per year, are financed through a dealership, and around 61% are financed from other sources. As noted last week, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, fin finance commitments for motor vehicles totalled around $2.8 billion in the month of December 2017. For the calendar year 2017, finance commitments for motor vehicles totalled around $35.7 billion. The Australian Automobile Association notes that for its hypothetical household, Average weekly car loan payments were estimated to be around $122 in both capital cities and in regional areas in Australia. This was the largest vehicle related expense for the, for the hypothetical household in both capital cities and regional areas with repayments larger than weekly fuel costs. Car dealers can have three different roles under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act, or as we've come to call it in these hearings, the National Credit Act. They may be, first, holders of an Australian credit licence. Second, they may be appointed as a credit representative of another Australian credit licensee. Or, they may be exempt from the credit licensing regime, including most relevantly by reason of the fact that they may be described as a supplier of goods under Regulation 23 of the National Credit Regulations. The third exemption, Commissioner, being the supplier of goods or services, is known, and you will hear it referred to, as the point of sale exemption. <coughs> When the National Credit Act and its regulations were enacted, members of parliament foreshadowed this exemption may be reviewed in the short term. However, the point of sale exemption remains approximately eight years later, which means that many intermediaries are not required to comply with the responsible lending obligations of the National Credit Act. ASIC indicates that the majority of car dealers engage in credit activities by relying upon the point of sale exemption, rather than as credit licensees or credit representatives. In all cases in which car finance is provided, there is an obligation placed on the lender 
to ensure that the consumer credit contract complies with the National Credit Act. According to further information provided by ASIC to the Commissioner on the 7th of March this year, and as mentioned in Council Assisting's opening statement on the 13th of March, ASIC has taken the following action against credit provi providers failing to assess properly whether a car loan is not unsuitable. ASIC has banned, cancelled, suspended or placed conditions on the licence of 19 individuals or companies from providing credit services, 11 of which are permanent bans. For failing to verify customers' circumstances and or assess properly whether a loan is not unsuitable. Following referral to the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, four credit service providers were convicted of criminal offences. Two entities have paid infringement notices totalling $411,400 and five, approximately $5.7 million has been paid in civil penalties and over 17 million has been paid in remediation or compensation. Also, as Senior Counsel Assisting noted in that opening statement, and as previously mentioned, ASIC has, already, has also introduced new, new rules prohibiting flex commissions for car loans. Those new rules will commence on the 1st of November 2018. To explain, a flex commission is paid by lenders to car finance brokers, typically car dealers, allowing the dealers to set the interest rate on the car loan. ASIC explained that its key findings are, were that flex commissions distort pricing arrangements and are a remuneration structure that has four outcomes. First, it means that the interest rate charged to, a, to the consumer is not related to their credit rating or the risk of default, but to their financial sophistication, degree of financial literacy and capacity to negotiate to protect their interests. Second, they said that flex commissions provide an incentive for sales intermediaries, relevantly car dealers, to increase the price of a credit contract in a way that does not relate to the credit risk of the particular consumer. Third, they operate in a way that is not transparent for consumers or understood by them at the point of sale. And fourth and finally, ASIC said that they can operate unfairly in any individual transaction. ASIC formally banned flex commissions in the car finance market with the legislative instrument to ban these commissions registered on the Federal Register of Legislative Interests on 6 September 2017. The legislative instrument operates so that the lender, not the car dealer, has responsibility for determining the interest rate that applies to a particular loan. The car dealer cannot suggest a different rate that earns them more commissions. Car dealers will have a limited capacity to dis discount the interest rate and receive lower commissions, leading to lower costs for credit. Lenders and dealerships will have until 1 November of this year to update their business models and implement new commission arrangements that comply <coughs> with the new legislative instrument. Commissions on loans are not the only source of profit for car loan intermediaries. The profit margin for car dealers rely not only on car sales, but on ancillary services, including the sale of spare parts, after sale services, such as ongoing services, and the sale of finance and insurance. This profit margin is generally considered on a whole of transaction basis rather than on the, each of the individual components. You have heard evidence about add-on insurance and it is not intended to rehearse again that which we heard when Ms Orr dealt with the topic earlier this week. The focus here will be on its prevalence in the car loan industry. Indeed, add-on insurance is a common feature of the average car loan transaction. 
These policies can cover risks relating to the car itself, tyre and rim insurance, for example, mechanical breakdown insurance, but also the consumer's liability under a related finance contract, which has been used to obtain the car, including customer credit insurance. In early 2016, ASIC's review of add-on insurance referred on add-on insurance report number 492 entitled A Market That Is Failing Consumers, The Sale of Add-on Insurance Through Car Dealers, found that for the products included in its review, 75% of the distribution of add-on insurance by dollar value was through car dealers. ASIC's review also found that add-on insurance products sold through car dealers provided significantly poor outcomes for consumers. The th three key findings of that report included, first, consumers receive low claim payouts relative to the premiums. Based on the products included in ASIC's review, over a three year period, the gross amount paid in claims was $144 million, or only 9% of gross premiums, just over $1.6 billion. This is compared to car insurance, where the amount paid in claims is 85 cents in the dollar, and home insurance, which is 45 cents in the dollar. Consumers receive much less in second, the second finding was that consumers receive much less in claims than dealers receive in commission. Upfront commissions of up to 79% of the premium were paid to car dealers arranging the sale of add-on insurance products. Insurers paid $602.2 million in commissions to car dealers and only $144 million to consumers in respect of their claims. This means car dealers earned four times more in commissions than consumers received in claims. Third the, third, the report found that insurers sell products that are poorly designed. Consumers were often paying for something they did not need or that offered poor value. In some cases, the average claim was less than or similar to the average premium paid. We now turn to the case studies that will be considered in respect of car loans over the coming day. The first case study that we, look, that we will look at relates to Westpac's loan practices. Westpac provides finance under the brand names of St George and Bank of Melbourne, and those loans are typically received via intermedi dealer intermediaries. In its submissions to the Commission, Westpac acknowledged engaging misconduct in instances in which it has financed add-on insurance that was unsuitable for customers who bought the insurance as part of a car loan package from a third-party car dealer. In one instance, in 2016, ASIC cont contacted Westpac about a customer who purchased a car on behalf of a de facto partner who was himself unable to obtain finance due to his poor credit history. Despite only being employed on a casual basis, the customer was sold insurance in the form of a gap cover policy and a walk away policy by the dealer. These products were deemed to provide no cover or an unnecessarily high level of cover for the consumer. Westpac remediated this matter by waiving the remaining balance of the loan and taking steps to ensure the customer did not have a default listing with a credit reporting body. Westpac also undertook a review of loans originated by that dealer. Westpac acknowledged other instances of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to car loans, primarily comprising breaches of responsible lending obligations. In one instance, FOSS, the Financial Ombudsman Service, found that a dealer approved a loan to a 19-year-old customer who was working in a casual job that she had held for only two months. Despite the FOSS finding, approximately a year after the loan was approved, the balance 
of the loan had not been written off and about $14,000 was still owing. In another instance, a loan was approved to a customer who had provided only one payslip, which was four months old and showed yearly earnings to date of $728 for a casual job. No rent or board was included in serviceability calculations and an undocumented Centrelink carers payment was included in the calculation of monthly income. The Commission will hear evidence from that consumer, a Ms Nalini Thiruvangadam, who entered into a car loan with Westpac in July 2012. At the time that the car loan was approved, Ms Thiruvangadam's fortnightly repayments for her car loan totaled just under 30% of her income. She subsequently became unable to work as a result of injury and suffered financial hardship as she continued to attempt to make loan repayments. <clears throat> in around November 2017, Bank of Melbourne acknowledged that her loan should not have been approved. Her story provides a lens through which to view some of the issues which arise for Australians in their transactions with lenders and others in the car loan industry. We will also hear evidence from Mr Philip Godkin, Westpac's General Manager, Specialist Finance Business Bank. He will give evidence about Westpac's review of Ms Thiruvangadam's situation, including Westpac's acknowledgement that the processes in relation to approval of her loan were deficient. More broadly, Mr Godkin will give evidence as to the practices at Westpac, how they have changed since Ms Thiruvangadam obtained her loan, as well as the monitoring in place at Westpac in relation to add-on insurance. The second case study that we will look at is ANZ's car loan practices. As we have already noted, ASIC has already secured penalties in respect of breaches of the National Credit Act for lack of verification of borrowers' payslips by Asanda Finance, which was at the relevant time owned by ANZ. ANZ expects to remediate approximately 320 car loan customers for loans taken out through the relevant third party intermediaries from 2013 to 2015. It expects the remediation to reach a total amount of around $5 million. So far, it has paid $100,000. This case study will look more broadly at the practice of, of, of Asanda in assessing and verifying loans through intermediaries. As already noted, this assumes significance where the intermediary may not be subject to the various obligations under the National Credit Act. But the lender, in this case Asanda, remains so bound. Mr Guy Mendelson, ANZ's General Manager, Small Business Bank, who at various times has had roles of responsibility in respect of Asanda, will give evidence about ANZ's processes for car loans arranged through intermediaries. He will also give evidence about various incentives in place in relation to add-on insurance, and finally give evidence about various fraudulent conduct of intermediaries which has come to ANZ's attention and what <coughs> ANZ has done in response to those issues. Finally, in this part of the first hearings, a statement will be tendered of the evidence of Mr Michael Sadat, the Senior Executive Leader of the Deposit Takers and Insurers and Credit Services Team at ASIC and Regional Commissioner for New South Wales. As the Commission has heard in opening, both last week uh, and, and in what has been said today, ASIC has been involved in regulating the car finance industry, including by the introduction of the recent ban on flex commissions and in relation to responsible lending practices. Mr Sadat's statement addresses three, will address three principal topics. It will address the steps that ASIC has taken in relation to the regulation of flex commissions. It will address the steps that ASIC has taken in relation to add-on insurance and it will address the views currently held by ASIC in relation to the operation of the point of sale exemption. 
If it pleases the Commission, I now call Ms Thuravanga Dam to give evidence. Do go into the witness box, please, Ms Thuravanga Dam. Now, uh, would you prefer to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation? Oath, please. Oath. Very well, swear the witness. I'm sorry. Okay. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by my mighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, please. Thank you. Ms. Thuravangadam, as I've said to other witnesses, just stop, take a deep, deep breath. <laughs> now, Mr. Donnelly. Thank you. Can you please tell the Commission your full name? Nalini uh, Thuravangadam. And I, I don't need you to tell the Commission your address. We know your address. Um, <coughs> what is your present occupation? Mr. Vangadam? I'm not working at the moment. Um, you've been asked to give evidence today about your experience in obtaining a car loan. Can you please tell the Commission why you decided to look to buy a new car in 2000? Before we, before we get to that, I think just for her protection, we'd better ah, make yes. sure it's all under um, compulsion yes. and therefore produce the summons. Of and, course. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Then the statement. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, did you receive a summons to come today, Ms. Thiravanga? Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, and do you have that with you? Yes. I tender that summons. You assume I'm keeping up with the numbers, Mr. Brunelli. That's a rash assumption. Um, exhibit 1.136, I think. 137, I'm told. Exhibit 1.137, summons to... Ms. Thiravangadam, yes. Thank you. And did you did you prepare a statement, Ms. Thiravangadam, for the purposes of giving evidence today? Yes, I did. Um, and do you have that um, with you? Yes, I have. And did you sign that statement on the 15th of March of this year? Yes, I did. And it has some exhibits attached to it? Yes. And is it true and correct? True and correct. Thank you. I tender that statement. Exhibit 1.138 statement, Nalini Devi Thiravangadam. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Commissioner, for, for slowing me down. Uh, Ms Thiravangadam, can I ask you, please, to tell the Commission why you decided to buy a new car in 2012? The reason I decided to buy a new car is because uh, I had a second-hand Mitsubishi Magna and um, I was driving one day with my kids. So all of a sudden, it caught fire around the engine uh, side. So uh, it was told to the mechanic and uh, the mechanic uh, had a look and he said that at the moment I can repair, just briefly I can repair, but long run you have to buy a car and the reason why I have to buy a car is because I need to pick my kids and drop my kids to school. And also at that time I was working, I need a car to go like uh, from home to home to look after elderly residents. Yeah. I see. And how, um, how did you um, intend to buy this car? Well, by getting a loan through bank. Okay. And what did you, what did you do? Um, what did you do? Um, to look for a loan for your car? Well, I called several banks, the major banks first, and then uh, one of them is Westpac because I had an account with Westpac. And then after that, some finance company and also car dealers around my area. I see. And when you rang, um, and when you, you said that you rang um, Westpac, um, what did they say um, about your, uh, your desire to borrow money to buy a car? Well, she went through a few questions and then she asked me to hold on and then she came back on the phone like after one or two minutes and she said that, you know, I'm sorry at this uh, stage I can't approve your loan because it looks like you have some credit problem. And she asked me to call the credit office to find out the history. 
And do you know what that credit problem was? Yes, I had a uh, Citibank credit card. It was not paid. So I think I, I had the idea that it could be the one. And after you called um, Westpac, who else? Um, you said you called some other uh, um, banks. Yes. Um, who else did you call? Commonwealth, ANZ, and National Bank. I see. And other finance company too. And were you able to um, obtain a loan from any of them? No. Um, you said that you rang um, some finance companies. Did you ring anyone else? Uh, car dealers also around my area first. And then none of them wanted to give me a loan, finance. I see. Um, and can you explain then um, how you did come to um, buy yourself um, a car? Well, I was searching online for all these numbers, like finance company numbers and things, and one of the company was, one of the dealer was this dealer that I bought this car. It's about 50 kilometers away from my house. And I spoke to the staff, uh, called the car dealership, and I spoke to the staff, and she put me through the manager in charge. And then when I spoke to the manager, I, I explained myself that I tried to call several banks, major banks, and they didn't approve my uh, loan. And also I did call finance and car dealers around my area. None of them approved. And uh, he said that, don't worry, you come to my car dealer, and I will, you are definitely going back with the car tonight. And so having been told that on the phone, what did you then do? Well, I told him, look, I've, I've called several places as major banks and finance and all the old uh, rejected. I don't want to drive all the way to that particular place, about 50 kilometers away, as I said. And uh, unless I know, I will, uh, if I, you're going to tell me the answer that no, after me arriving there, like you said, no, your loan has not been approved. So he said, no, no, you don't have to worry about that. I can t tell you right now, you will definitely go back with a car. Um, so what did you um, what did you do then that afternoon? After that, I called one of my friends and asked her whether she can come with me to this dealer shop, which is quite far and it's a very unfamiliar area for me. And then uh, she said, OK, I picked my friend and I went to the school and picked the boys after school and we drove to this place. I missed few, but I didn't know how to go. I stopped and asked people and then finally we went to the uh, dealer shop. Okay, and can you explain? Um, can you explain what happened when you arrived um, at the dealership? When when we arrived at the dealership, uh, one of the staff came and uh, greeted us and uh, uh, told us to sit in the lounge. And after that, uh, uh, um, the manager came. He introduced uh, another guy came over and he introduced himself as a manager, and then he took me to his office. I see. And when you went into um when you went into the manager's office, what, um, what did the manager say? The manager was asking me more like personal questions, just like, a start, like friendly questions, like uh, which country I was from and all these things. And after that, he asked me whether I was working or not and what type of job I'm doing and all these things. Uh, so yeah. this is in July 2012? Yes, correct. Um, so at the time, um, were you working? Yes, I was working, yeah. Um, and what was your job at the time? Personal care attendant. I see. Uh -huh. um, and were you, what, what was your, um, uh, what were you paid approximately? Approximately about 350 per fortnight. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and did you, um, did you have any other income at that time? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I had Centrelink payments like family tax A and B. So I'll get about 600 something around that figure. And did yeah. you tell those things, are they the things that you told to the manager when yes. you were speaking yes, to? Yes, I did. To him. Now, I'm going to ask you now in your evidence, you say that he rang someone. I don't want you to say who, the name of the person. Sure. But can you explain what happened after you'd had this discussion about how much income you had? Mm -hmm. What did the manager then do? Well, while I was in his office, he was on the phone on and off talking to someone and uh, he was talking quite long, quite some time. And after that, he asked me to go out of his office and sit in the lounge with my, my friend and kids. And then he left the office and he went outside the car yard and he opened the door, the, the car that he said that, you know, that's the car that I'm going to buy. 
and within like two minutes he came inside and he went to his room of office and uh, he was talking over the phone for close to like probably about one and a half hours to two hours and then after that he called me back in and then he asked me whether I got any other properties and things like that. I said, no, I don't have any properties. In fact, I'm renting in a, in a unit and I'm paying about 1003 per month. And then, uh, then he started to type and fill up, I think it must be the application forms or what. Yes. And then after that, he asked me to sign in several places. And uh, then he said, you got the car. As I promised that you'll go back with your car. Uh, with a car, with a new car, uh, not a new car. I was asking for a new car, but he said, you got the car. He, yeah. So if we can go back um, a step, he um, <coughs> he asked you if you owned any property? Yes, he did. Um, and um, and did you, you told him that you were renting? Yes. Uh, and did, whilst he went through um, these questions with you, what, what was he doing? He was just uh, typing. I don't know what he was typing. I think the application forms or something. And, and did he um, did he make any other phone calls? Yes, he did several phone calls. Uh, every now and then he'll make phone calls and then he'll hang up and then he'll type. Was he called... I don't want you to say the name of, of the person. Sure. Uh, but was it the same person that he was yes, calling? Yes, because he was very friendly and pr I, I had an impression that the, he, he, the manager and the guy over the phone must be very close, so. Why did you have that impression? Because he was joking around and laughing. Like and very what, was he, what was he talking to him about? I can't remember at the m moment, sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, during, the, during the course of those conversations, was anything said about a loan for you? You mean over the phone with the other? Yes. I, as I said, I can't remember that far. See, mm -hmm. and you said that the um, the manager pointed out a car to you? Yes. And what was the car that he pointed out? A uh, Ford Focus Ambient. See? Mm -hmm. um, and was that the car that you were going to buy? No. That's not the car that I wanted to buy, but then um, he filled up and he, he pointed that's the car that I will be given, I'll, I'll be buying. So I had no other choice, so. I see, and, um, and what, you then said that he'd filled out some forms and, and I interrupted you and you said, did you then sign those yeah. forms? Yes, I did, yeah. Um, and what were those forms that, um, that you were given? Look, I didn't even see what forms I was given. All I was told to just sign, he just pointed out and say, sign here, sign there. That's about it. Uh, and you've, um, you're, you've signed a, um, a, a, a statement that we've gone to previously. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, can I ask you to identify um, a document for me, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's NDT 1 to the statement. Was this the um, was this one of the, the pay slips that you gave to Correct. the manager? Yes. And if you turn over the page, or maybe two pages along, um, and is this another one of the pay slips that you gave him? Correct. Um, and you said that you signed some documents. If I can go to um, NDT4. Um, do you remember this document? Correct, yes. Okay, and what, um, and you, it's blacked out, but it, it probably isn't on the copy that you have. Is that your signature at the bottom? Yes. Um, and if you go a few pages ahead, mm -hmm. did you also sign 
I think it's three pages ahead, yep. page three at the top. Did you also sign there? Correct. And what happened after you signed, um, signed those documents? Well, the manager told me, I, uh, as I promised, you got the car. It's your car now. And then he uh, took me outside the, uh, his office. And then one of another staff was waiting there. And he said, uh, I'll take you for a test drive. So I didn't want to go for a test drive because it was really late. But he insists, and I still went. So by, by the end of the day, I did went for a short test drive and came back to the car dealer. While I was driving, the, the, uh, the other staff told me that this is a second-hand car. So then only I was like being taken back. I was asking when I spoke to him over the phone that I need a new car. I don't want to go through the process of buying a second-hand car and then later on I'll have to repair and these things. And also I'm dealing with elderly people. I have to pick them up and take them for shopping. I don't want to risk anybody. So that's the main reason why I wanted to buy a new car. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and and who was it that um, and who was it that said that to you? Did you say? And a salesperson. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, you went for a, a, um, a short drive, did you? Test drive. Yeah. And, th and then what did you do after that? After that, we came back to the car dealer uh, yard, the car yard, and then we left. Uh, we, I went inside the uh, car dealer shop, and the manager was still around, and he was laughing, and then he was talking to my friend and my children, and he were, he told to my friend, in later on, if you need any car loan, you can come and see me. So that's what he said, and we left after that. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and um, did you take any documents home with you? Yes, I did. Um, and... Um, did you take the car home with you that night? No, I did not. So when, um, what happened with the car? I left it there because it was a very unfamiliar, you know, for the first time I'm going to drive another new car, I was very scared and it was already dark, quite late. And then um, I left it there and then I went back home that night. I went through a few documents that was given to me and I realized that it's, it's a really stated there, uh, it's a demo car. And also, it, uh, in one of the pages, I think I saw that it has done so many kilometers. And I was like, really, like, I didn't expect that. So the next morning, I called, I spoke to the manager, and I said, Look, I'm not, I don't want this car. I'm not going to come back and take this car. He said, No, that car belongs now. It's already yours. You already bought it. You already signed all the documents. You have to take it. Did you? Um when you were reading those documents, did you notice anything else? Um, when you got home that night and mm -hmm. you were looking at the documents, did you realise yes. anything else? Also, the I think the payments and uh, it, it's a demo card. That's the main thing that really... What do you mean by the payments? Payments like how much I have to pay every fortnight, I think. And, and how much were you required to pay? 259 and cents. I'm not sure. So 98 see. cents. So. Um, Per fortnight. Per it? fortnight, that's right. And um, and what what did you, what was your reaction when you read that? I was shocked, and I know I can't afford to pay that because when I was signing or before signing, he did not explain to me anything how much I'm going to pay and all this. Nothing was explained to me. He just most of the time he was over on the phone, and then only the last period of time he asked me to sign, and that's it. I see. Uh, and um, when you spoke to um, the manager on the next day, um, did you say anything about the payments? Yes, I told him. The payments, uh, you know, I really can't. I won't be able to afford to pay the, those payments. And uh, also, I... After some time, I can't remember exactly, I received a letter, I think, from Bank of It started on the 13th of uh, June, August or something like that, the first payment, and it falls on Monday. My, my Centrelink payment doesn't go on Monday. Is, is this the document? If I, I'll show you the document. Is It's NDT um, 8. Correct. Um, 
and if you go to the next page, mm -hmm. you said something about the 13th of August. Why was that? That was the first payment, and it falls on Monday. My payment doesn't go on Monday. Centrelink payment goes on Wednesday, and my salary goes on the next day, Thursday. So I was I, I asked him whether he can adjust the day, at least put it for Wednesday. He said, no, you, you have to borrow from either your uncle or someone to pay the payments. Uh, and um, and what happened then when, um, or did you make that payment? I did. And um, and what happened after that? Every time you, so I should say, was the car ultimately delivered to you? Yes. After a few days, uh, two guys from salesperson came and dropped it at my house, and yeah. I see. And did you start driving the car then? Yes, I did. Um, and. Um, can you explain to the Commission um, what happened um, then in terms of your repayments to um, to Bank of Melbourne? Every payment I was struggling. As I, I told you, that my, inc my since I was working as a casual, my income wasn't good. So I do pick up a shift every now and then just to catch up with the payments and things like that. But I was really, really struggling. And I used to call Bank of No, uh, yes, I used to call Bank of Melbourne and ask for like you know, extension this and that quite a lot of time. And um, and um, when did this start happening? I had a fall in sometime in September, the very same year when I bought that car, and I hurt both of my knees. I couldn't even walk. It was quite serious, so I lost my job at that time. So then I called Bank of Melbourne and told them, like, look, I had this fall and I'm, I couldn't go to work and uh, I'm no more working. And uh, how am I going to pay these payments? Could you help me or could you advise me on this? So then after that, uh, they came up with a, like a hardship payment uh, thing. Yes. They extended, they asked me not to pay for certain. First, they told me six months, you don't have to pay anything. But then I received a letter saying that, you know, it's only for six weeks. Yeah. I see. And mm -hmm. so um, at what period of time did this happen? So you bought your car in July 2012 and you said that you had a yes. fall in September. September, yeah. And, and when did you ring up um, and ask for the um, extension? For your I car? think after a few months. A few months, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then once that time passed, um, were you able to make repayments after that? No. So what happened then? Every now and then I, I, will, I will go to my uncle's house and he will lend me money to catch up with the payments. And I also had my, my, my brother used to help me. So that's how I used to catch up with the payments and I was really struggling. I have to stop my rental payments several months, like two, three months, stop the payment, uh, paying rental. And because I've been living in that rental property for some time, like 12, 13 years, the owner was extremely good. And when I paid this bill, I have to catch up with that. So I was just juggling around. And it really, really, it was very hard for me. Um, and, um, and then did you speak to, um, did you speak to Bank of Melbourne again during uh, this period? Yes, I did. And they said no, because they have given me like six months extension that I don't have to pay. And then uh, they said the, the, that's the maximum they can give and you have to pay somehow. They, that's all they told me. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and um, did, you, did you have any other discussions with people from the Bank of Melbourne during this period? Yes, I did. They, they used to call me several times you know, chase for payments and things like that. Sometimes they said, they, they said, they're coming now to your doorstep and we are going to tow your car away and you have to pay whatever balance is there in full, like 20,000 straightforward like that. And I told them, I used to cry back them several times, don't do this to me because I got two kids. It's very hard. And did, did you have other bills at the time and what did you do about your electricity bills and other bills? Everything was like, you know, back, a lot of payments was really not paid. I even, they even asked me to apply for hardship, like electricity companies. 
which I did. Yeah. How'd you for the electricity company? Yes. Yeah. I see. And were you able to make any more payments for your car loan? I still continued to pay, but I was really struggling with the help of my uncle. And then, as I said, I don't pay my rental. And at one point, you know, the owner is very good. At one point, the, the real estate agent took me to the WCAD or something like that. Yes. Yeah, and then they put me on plan to catch up with the payments, which took months. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and then, or can you... I will, sorry to no, interrupt. No, please. I also sold, like, you know, jewellery, like, was given to me by my mum, and also jewellery for my sons, given by my mum. All I sold in a, like a cash converter shop, like that, just to catch up with their payments. Yeah. And... I'm sorry. Can just you tell me about... Um, just take a, a moment. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Are you okay to go on? I'm all right. Yes, yeah, go you. on, Mr. Dinelli. <coughs> um, can I ask you a few questions about the car? Sure. Um, so this is obviously over time. You've been um, doing your best to make these loan repayments. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me... If the, how the car um, was working during that time? So when, I, uh, when I bought this car, it was working like five, six months. It was okay. After that, I had quite a lot of problem. Like whenever I reverse to them from my house, it goes to the, there's a main road there. It goes and stop right in the middle of the road several times. And the person who's right at the back, he used to go, that guy come and ask me, what's wrong, can I help you? And then even he tried to start, he can't start, then he said, I'll push you, try to like drive slowly to the side. And then also near some, uh, my son, when I went to pick my boys from the school, it stops right in the middle of the road. It starts to jerk and then it stops like that. Continuously it was jerking and so I called um, the, com the dealer first. I called the dealer and I... Speak to the manager? Yes, I did. And I told him that, you know, this car is jerking within six months. I don't know what's the problem. He just told me straight on my face, it's your driving. Perhaps it's your driving. And I'm thinking, I, I doubt at one point, I doubt myself, maybe it's my driving. But then I just forgot it. I didn't want to say anything. So I started to drive, but eventually every started became worse. And then uh, I called them up again. Every time I call from there on, they don't even put me to the manager. They try to, like, you know, they don't return my call. They do, don't do anything about it. So finally I said, uh, I can't come to that particular dealership where I bought the car. Can, you, can I go to the closest deal, um, Ford company to get it checked? Before that, I took to the, mine, the mechanic that I used to bring my car, and he said, no, this one, you got the warranty, you take it to Ford back. So I went to took it to the Ford. They checked and they said there is a problem with the clutch or transmission, something like that. And after that, they repaired everything, done, finished, continue the next day before a year comes, it starts to jerk. It happens several. Sometimes I'm so free, I'm driving on the freeway and it starts to jerk and my children's in the car, mom, is it going to stop? You're going to die or what? Something like that. Because it jerks, it's really jerks, it's really very jerks a lot. So. And and did did you ultimately come to to ring Ford about the car? Yes, I did. Yeah, and I, uh, sorry, go on. I took this car for three times to get every year. Three times I've taken this to the dealership to check. And then every time they give me a complaint that it's a clutch or transmission problem, and they get it done. So three times I've taken and they've done that. And then finally one year, that was last year, they said, uh, why don't you call the legal aid at Broadmeadows and take the advice in, in regards to jerking and things like that. So that's how, sorry. And what did you do when you went, what happened when you went, um, you were told to go to legal aid, what did you do? I contacted legal aid at Broadmeadows. They directed me to consumer action law in the city. Yep. That's how I spoke to the lawyers. And then, yeah, from there on.
And uh, and what did you do um, after you'd spoken to to the lawyers? What did you do in relation to the car? Well, I gave uh, whatever the lawyers asked me, documents and things like that, I gave it to them. And uh, I'm still driving the car, but yeah, it's still jerking. Did the lawyers, um, did the lawyer send a letter to the bank on your behalf? Yes, he did. Um, and, um, and what was, um, what was the purpose of sending that letter to the Bank of Melbourne? Uh, I think to get the refund or something like that. And they've also charged me quite a lot of interest and things like that. And whenever I don't pay, the interest amount was quite high. And so, yeah. Um, and, um, and then did you receive a response from the bank? Yes, my lawyer received the response. They were corresponding with the, my lawyer. And after that, finally, one day, they sent me a letter saying that, you know, we are going to pay you this amount. Um, and can I go to NDT 16? Is, if you also look at the screen, mm -hmm. is there a Van Gadam? Yes. Is that the letter there that you that was sent to your lawyer? Yes. Um, and um, and you see that it said uh, that that letter says if you go down to the fourth paragraph, we have reviewed all the information we have to hand and the information you have provided and we agree the loan should not have been approved. Do you see that? Yes, I see. Um, therefore, we must consider what has to be done to put Miss Theravanga Dam in the position she would have been had the loan not been approved. Do you see that? Yes, I see. And then, um, if you go to the second page, mm -hmm. they um, made an offer to you for you to keep the vehicle, do you see number one? You could keep the vehicle and bank to offer 20,000 as full and final settlement of the loan, or you could surrender the vehicle to the bank mm -hmm. um, and the bank would give you $24,000 as full and final settlement of the loan in the matter. Um, what did you do when you received this letter? I took the second option. I see. Yes. Um, Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Sorry, I, I took the first up op option. The first, first option. One. Yep, so sorry. that is you, um, you, you kept the car and the bank gave you twenty thousand dollars. Exactly. Is that right? Sorry. Yep. Um, <coughs> now the letter, the letter that you um, received. Um, Um, the letter that you received from um, the bank also said that, um, the, that the application that you made when you went to the dealership said that you had no existing liabilities and that you were living with an uncle at this time and that no rent or board was taken into consideration. Was that right? That's not correct. And have you been paid... Um, the money by the Bank of Melbourne? Yes. And and have you, did you keep the car? Yes, I keep the car. And do you still have the loan to the Bank of Melbourne? No, I don't know. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any party other than... West Pack seek leave to cross-examine the witness. Uh, Mr. Sheehan. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mrs. Thirasangadam, my, my name's Sheehan, Hi. and I appear on behalf of um, Bank of Melbourne and the other companies in the West Pack group. And forgive me for keeping you here a couple of minutes longer, but it, it, it right. will only be a couple of minutes. Um, now, you mentioned in your statement and in your evidence today that you made, I think, at, at least eight attempts to obtain finance 
for a car before you went to the dealership where you eventually obtained one. Correct. And that was over a period of uh, about six months, is that right? Correct, I think, more or less. About that? About that, more. Now, um, I, I take it that you had decided that it was very important to get a, new, a car to replace your damaged Mitsubishi? Correct. And, um, and it was very important because you needed a car simply to remain in, in employment? Exactly. Yeah. Now, um, and I think if I understand what you've told us, you, you, th you decided that you needed a new car so that it would be reliable. Exactly. And you thought you needed a reliable car to continue to do the work that you were doing. Exactly. Okay. Now, having been through that process of speaking to eight people um, about um, obtaining a car, um, would I be right in thinking that, that you'd reached a conclusion that um, uh, you thought that you would be able to pay off a new car? It might be over five years, but um, assuming you could continue to work? Yes. And um, obviously, if you um, became unable to work for some reason, then that would cause problems. You agree? Yes. Yeah. But, but did you think that the risk of losing your ability to work immediately um, was, a, was a lesser risk than the prospect of being un unable to pay off a car loan some years down the track if something went wrong. Sir, can you repeat that question? No. Sorry. I'll withdraw that question. Now, um, when you went to the car dealer in question here, that was... Um, about f five years ago now? Six, yeah. Six. Um, I just want to suggest to you that, um, that uh, your dealings with, with that car dealership took place over a couple of days. That is to say, uh, you had some dealings with them before the 26th of July when you went out to see the dealer. I can't remember to that extent, sorry. Okay. But it's possible you might have spoken to them on the phone uh, a day or two before to talk about a possible car purchase and car loan. Correct, I think. I can't remember that, Maya. Sorry about she that. She said in evidence, did she not, that she had rung the dealership and the dealer had said, in effect, don't worry, you'll go home with a new car. She did give that in evidence, yeah. yes. Um, uh, Commissioner, uh, I don't need to show this document to the witness because it's not a document she's ever seen before. It's an internal um, St George Bank record, but I would uh, tender uh, WBC 104-003-7572, uh, which could be described as St George Sovereign screenshots for the period commencing 24 July 2012. Um, and I have no further questions for Mrs. Thera Vanganam. Exhibit. Uh, yes, Mr. Dinelli, have you seen this? I'm sorry? You've seen this document, have you? Uh, no, I haven't. I'm sorry, we did give notice to our friends. Um, I, that may have. No, I know we have given notice Thank of this. Uh, exhibit 1.139, uh, St George Sovereign Screenshots from 24 July, July 2012, 2012 WBC uh, 104003-7572. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Yes, Mr. Dumelli. Thank you. There's no further questions. Yes. Is there a Vanganam? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Yep. Theravangadan, uh, you may step down and you're expecting further attendance. Thank you. <coughs>